A rancher and his granddaughter drove the back roads, roads of dirt and gravel, grass growing up to the door of the pickup. In the little creek that feeds into the Red River, his granddaughter tells him with a voice so sure, there's a body in the water. Without his glasses, it looked more like a calf that wandered too far into the creek and drowned. When the rancher came back to that same spot the next morning without his young granddaughter, he realized she was right. A girl drifted along the bank in the red, opaque water. She was unrecognizable. Her sandy brown hair fanned away from her. But there was no mistaking, she was dead. Local law enforcement cluttered the old bridge and dirt road as they set out to recover the body. And that old bridge, it told a darker story. If you drive out to Belknap Bridge today, you can still see the spot stained to the bridge, a scar for that spot, and anyone who knows its story. In 1996, a typical high school teenage girl snuck out for a night of fun with her friends and the boy she had a crush on. It would be the last time Heather Rich would ever sneak out of her bedroom window. Welcome to the True Crime Librarian. I'm your librarian and host, Ashley. Tonight I want to tackle a case unknown to many, but changed the lives of everyone it touched. Small towns pack big punches when it comes to gossip. Everyone knows everybody and everything. This case was no different for the little town of Warica, Oklahoma. When a 16-year-old cheerleader goes missing for eight days before a Texas rancher finds her floating in a little creek 45 minutes from home. Warning, this episode contains graphic detail of murder, adult-themed situations, and explicit language. Listeners' discretion is advised. If you feel that this may be too much for you, I suggest that you skip this episode or have someone listen for you or with you. Tonight's case takes place in a little bitty town called Warica in Oklahoma. Warica lies on what was known as the Chisholm Trail, but to many, it's only known as US-81. It runs from Fort Worth, Texas and into Oklahoma and goes through desolate and fading cattle towns. And in 1974, Dwayne and Gail Rich moved to the tiny town. They believed they found a place that was peaceful and safe to raise their family. Back in Lawton, where they're from, a neighbor had been raped, and they could not imagine that a crime so heinous could ever happen in Little Warica, let alone their family. In 1993, Duane was burned over 60% of his body. The riches would go through a very difficult season for their family. Gail became the sole breadwinner for the home. And Heather, their third child, she's one of four. She has two older brothers and one younger brother. Gail had purchased a Subway franchise to help make ends meet. And she would work long hours in order to make up for the income loss with Dwayne being home. Heather was left to keep up with the house. She did the cooking and the cleaning. She took care of her dad, changed bandages. And if she wasn't at home covering for her mom, then she was at Subway covering for her mom so her mom could be home. And Gail admittedly says, quote, our lives were in chaos. Heather was your typical teenage girl. She obsessed over her appearance, hoping to attract the boys. She was a cheerleader, and she could talk the pants off of anyone. She was well known in her tiny town, and according to her mother, she befriended the underdog, saying there was good in everyone. The summer before eighth grade, Heather took her vanity to a whole new level. 
she began throwing up to maintain her weight. With her father losing his job and being injured and her mom not really being home a whole lot, Heather had a lot of stress. So she, she took pride in herself, but underneath all that pride, she had began cutting herself on the insides of her thighs. For Heather, this was just a way to control something going on in her life. It helped her have a release on the things she couldn't. And in small town Warika, teens had very little to do. There wasn't movie theaters, there's no parks, there's no rec centers, uh, there's no open lake cafes, there's not even a stoplight in this town. So virtually there was nothing to keep the teens out of trouble. So they came up with their own fun. They would drive the back roads drinking and experimenting with drugs. They would have bonfires. They would do late night swims and creeks and lakes. And Heather was one of those who couldn't stand staying in. Randy Wood said, quote, Heather was always wanted to break the monotony. She was restless. She hated being bored. Randy said that she would often climb out of her window and sometimes the very least thing that she would do was smoke a cigarette. At most, she would catch a ride and drag down Main Street. And if she wasn't on Main Street, then she was riding the back roads with other people. Heather was no stranger to drugs or alcohol. She had smoked pot and to her best efforts, she tried to keep up when others would drink. She would try to drink like they did, but she was a lightweight. And after a couple drinks, she was unsteady on her feet. In the spring of 1996, Heather started dating the local star high school football player, Randy Wood. He was older, but not by much. Randy was different. He came from a life of poverty. He lived with his grandmother in a rundown home. There was blankets for curtains. Some of the windows were busted out. And... He did everything he could to be better than how he was living, but he was no stranger to the partying lifestyle. His mother was known to party, and because of it, Randy smoked pot for the first time in third grade. By the time he was 13, he was getting high with his mom. And in his junior year of high school, she was at home at the dinner table with a boyfriend and there was methamphetamine on the table and she told randy to grab some and go away he did just that randy wanted nothing more than to escape his life he was living and his relationship with heather was nothing that was a typical high school romance it lacked the lust it lacked the romance people would actually never actually know that they were dating they would think that they were really good friends and when school started in the fall of 96, Randy and Heather were at the end of their relationship. Randy had heard that Heather had attended a co-ed party and ended up skinny dipping. And he wasn't at that party and he had had enough. And so they ended their relationship. And that was okay with Heather because she already had her sights set on another senior, Josh Bagwell. Josh Bagwell's family was known as the creme de la creme of Warwick, Oklahoma. He lived with his grandparents in one of the biggest houses in town, and he was known to have owned several new cars. Now, he's only a senior, so he's only been driving, what, two or three years? He's owned several new cars at this point. His family had money, and he knew it, and he would use it to his advantage. He even thought he could get away with resisting arrest after being pulled over one night for drinking and driving. But Heather didn't care. She had her eyes on his pretty new Dodge Stealth. And with the homecoming parade coming up, she wanted to ride in the back of his brand new car more than anything. And Josh, he agreed to let her. And she was so excited. On September 27th of 1996, Heather would show her small town a glimpse of her life that was beginning to spiral out of control. She showed up to a Friday night football game, her and another cheerleader, and they were noticeably drunk on the sidelines, laughing and giggling their way through the cheers. The two ended up suspended from school for three days, and there was a temporary suspension for their cheerleading squad. 
for most people, this would be a wake up call, but for Heather, she missed it. But Gail didn't. She got in contact with a psychiatrist and scheduled Heather appointment for October 3rd of 1996. Heather would never make that appointment. On October 2nd, 1996, Randy was just getting home from football practice one afternoon when Josh Bagwell showed up and he had a bottle of whiskey and a promise of a night of fun. The two ended up driving around and drinking until they found out a mutual friend of theirs, Curtis Gamble, had a case of beer. And since they wanted to prolong the fun, they stopped and picked him up. Now, Curtis Gamble is 19. He was already out of high school. He lived at home with his grandmother, Rita. He was a regular hunting buddy of Josh, and Randy had met him over the summer in a job where they had picked watermelons. Many said Curtis had a mean streak in him a mile wide. In his younger years, he served time in a juvenile detention center for bringing an unloaded gun to school and threatening to shoot a few of his teachers. Now, while he served time at this juvenile detention center, he let some of the other boys know a little fantasy of his. Curtis wanted to abduct a girl, rape her, then blow her head off. He would get his chance on the night of October 2nd and into the early morning of October 3rd. When Josh and Randy stopped to pick up Curtis, Josh called Heather. And I, I want to say that there was probably like a, a pager involved at this point where she paged him and he went to the payphone and he called her. And they set up a time to meet that night at 11 o'clock at a church. She just had to wait for her parents to go to bed. She was going to sneak out like she had done a million times before, no big deal, things would be fine. Long before teenagers had cell phones, they relied on what is known as a landline, and many people know what that is. But what some don't realize is that if you didn't call a number local to you, generally within the same small town or town that you're in, and you called somebody outside of that, that's considered what's called a long distance phone call. Cell phones today, we don't have to worry about it. Um, but back then, you did. And Gail would come home one night to a $300 phone bill, thanks to Heather making several long-distance phone calls. They would get into a fight this night, and Gail would say the last words to her daughter, All you ever do is cost me money. Now, Heather was your typical teenager. She threw a fit, she was mad, and she made it a point not to talk to her mother. As a matter of fact, that night when she went to go tell her parents goodnight, she went in there and she told her dad, Dwayne, goodnight, gave him a kiss. And then she proceeded to prance out of her parents' room, making sure her mother realized she wasn't telling her goodnight. She was mad. And none of us think that tomorrow's not going to come. So her mother just kind of let it go. She, you know, she was, she was upset too. They're tight on money. Dwayne's injured. He can't work. She's working long hours. She's depending on her children to pick up where she can't. $300 phone bill was just not something that they could afford to have at this moment. But Heather didn't see that. She was, like I said, she was your teenage girl. She talked. She, if she, you know, she's going to have to stay home. She can't go out nowhere. Well, then she's going to get on the phone and she's going to talk to her friends. That's just the way we are all wired. We all were at that age. We, you know, I can remember being on the phone and talking to my friends for long, long times. But I think by the point that I got a phone, long distance phone calls had not, um, like the local phone calls, I guess, had expanded a little bit more. They weren't as restrictive. But nevertheless, I mean, there was a couple times I made long distance phone calls and I paid for it with my mom. You know, you just you end up working harder and you have to pay that back. She didn't get that. She, you know, she, to her, her life was already chaotic. Her life was already spiraling out of control. And her mom to come home and complain was just beyond Heather. Just, you know, you know what, mom? I don't care. And she went on about her merry little way. 
Heather would climb out of her bedroom window that night and take off towards the church. And it was a little bit before she was supposed to meet Josh. So instead of waiting around at the church, she went on to his trailer. Now, Josh, Randy and Curtis, they pull up to the church and Heather's not there. So they go over to her house. Randy knows where she lives. And he goes up to her bedroom window and he taps on the window. She doesn't answer. And so the three boys are like, you know, let's just go back to Josh's house. His, his grandparents have a travel trailer out back. We'll party in that. We'll have a great time. Forget Heather. So they head over to the house. And when they pull up, there's Heather sitting on the steps of the travel trailer. And they all end up going inside. And when inside, Heather spots a fifth of gin. And so her and Josh start having what would be considered their first date. And with Randy being an ex and both him and Curtis being oddballs out, they are like, hey, give me the keys to the pickup. We're going to go drive around. We're going to give y'all, you know, some privacy. And Randy and Curtis, they take off and they're off for about an hour. And when they get back, Josh is putting his clothes on and Heather is drunk and naked. She had almost consumed the entire fifth of gin and like we said earlier, she's a lightweight, so for Heather, she was completely obliterated. And she became upset when she saw Randy, and she apologized profusely because she, I, she felt like she did Randy wrong because their relationship had never gone as far as it had gone with her and Josh that night. And so somehow her and Randy end up in the bedroom of the travel trailer. And while in there, her she's naked, and I guess she decides she's going to give Randy some. And so he's undressed, he's touching her, she's completely drunk, and she ends up passing out. So Randy says he wasn't about doing that, so he put his clothes back on and he went outside with Curtis and Josh. Now everybody's drinking, they're all drunk, Josh and Randy... They've been drinking since the afternoon football practice was over, basically. And Curtis, there's no telling when he started drinking. So everybody is definitely inebriated. And somehow the three boys, they start kind of instigating the other as to going back there and having sex with Heather's unconscious body. Randy still can't get behind it, even though they're all kind of egging each other on. Well, Curtis goes inside. He decides he's going to. He goes inside and he stays in there a while. And Randy and Josh, they're out front and they're just kind of bullshitting and drinking. And out comes Curtis. And he's, you know, buttoning up his shirt. And he tells Randy, she's, she's awake now. So Randy decides he's going to go back there. And he goes back to check. And she's still passed out drunk in the back of the travel trailer. So he goes back outside and him and Josh and Curtis start drinking some more and just talking. And then Heather does something none of them expected. She wakes up and screams before she passes out. And the first time the guys are like, what the heck was that? And then she does it a second time. And I can imagine the uneasiness that's starting to settle over the three guys because here's this young junior drunk in the back of the travel trailer and two out of the three guys have had sex with her, even though Randy technically did. He, you know, he digitally penetrated her. That is considered a sexual act, but in his mind, it, he didn't consider it. So two out of three, according to Randy, had already had sex with her. She's now woke up twice screaming before she passes back out. She does it one more time. That third time, Curtis breaks out. He decides he's not going down for a rape charge. You know, he'd served time before. He wasn't going to serve time for having sex with her. No way, no how. So I would say he starts in implying that he's going to kill her and Randy and Josh are like well he's drunk you know they didn't take too much to him talking and then he starts barking orders and he tells Randy to go back inside and get her dressed so Randy goes inside he puts every stitch of clothing back on Heather then him and Josh load her into the back seat of the pickup 
and Josh, Randy, and Curtis climb into the front seat, and they take off into the night. As Josh, Curtis, and Randy drive around, not really knowing where they're going, Randy's hoping that them just driving around means they're going to wait for her to sober her up, talk to her, then take her home. But then Curtis tells Josh to pull over. He says he knows exactly where he's going to take her, and he climbs in behind the wheel. 37 miles away from Warica, Oklahoma, sets Belk Knapp Creek. It's a stream that weaves away from the Red River. And to Texans and Oklahomans alike, the Red River is a sign of crossing into one state or the other, blending the two with the opaque clay-colored water. Belknap Creek Bridge sits just inside of Monte County in Texas. It's another stretch of royal land with tiny towns. Curtis knew this bridge well. His grandmother used to take him fishing there, calling it her, quote, beloved and secret corner of the river bottom. The tires crunched as it rolled down the isolated dirt road with grass that grew high. There wasn't another car or the promise of another car coming from either direction. Curtis pulls up to the bridge before he jumps out of the truck, grabbing his Mossberg 12-gauge shotgun. Curtis tells Josh and Randy to get her out and set her on the bridge, and he loads nine rounds of double-aught buckshot into his gun he calls Old Blackie. So Josh and Randy do what they're told. They get Heather out of the truck, they set her up on the bridge, she slumps over, so they set her up closer to the guardrail, and that way it can kind of hold her up. And Randy crawls back into the truck. He puts his hands over his ears, and he squeezes his eyes closed tight. And he hears one shot. Then he hears two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight more shots. When he crawls back out of the truck, he sees Heather's blood is pulled all on the old bridge. And he looks up and Curtis has the gun. He's loading nine more rounds into his shotgun. He tells Josh and Randy to get rid of her. So Josh ties a rock to her using a shoestring and him and Randy pick her up and toss her over the guardrail into the creek. Randy then goes and gets dirt and covers up the blood that's on the bridge. And the three crawl back into the truck and drive the 45 minute drive back to Warica. On October 3rd, 1996, Dwayne and Gail never imagined that they would wake up to a whole new life. But when they went into Heather's empty room, they soon knew. Gail and Dwayne went over to the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office to report Heather missing. But as soon as the sheriff's deputies hear of Gail and Heather's argument over the phone bill, they tell her and Dwayne to go home. She ran away. She's just trying to teach them a lesson. And Gail's like, I'm not going home and I'm not sitting there and waiting on her. She's not. She hasn't run away. She's missing. So her and Dwayne set out. They're going to figure out where their daughter is. Somehow or another, Gail ends up with that day's absentee list from the local high school. And not only is Heather's name on it, but so is Randy Wood. And Gail knows Randy because her, you know, Heather and Randy hung out a lot from the spring into the fall. So Gail sits down and she dials Randy Wood's phone number. Randy tells her that he was with Josh Bagwell all night until 6 a.m. And Gail knew Randy and she could hear the flatness and the exhaustion in her voice. And she asked him, she said, quote, Randy, if you knew anything that could help us find Heather, you would tell us, right? And without hesitation, he says, yes, ma'am. Gail gave in. And at some point, Randy said something about Josh and Heather talking. So she looks at the list and guess whose name's on that absentee list as well as Randy's and Heather's, Josh Bagwell. 
So she calls over to the very affluent teenager's home. And he basically is like, I don't know where she's at. I don't know what she's talking about. I haven't seen her. I haven't talked to her in a week. That's what he replies to her mother. Heather's disappearance quickly became small town gossip and tips and rumors milled through the streets, but none of them held any kind of validity. Then on October 10th, 1980, then on October 10th, 1996, local authorities and crime scene analysts flood the once deserted bridge. The young teenage girl's body was finally brought back to dry land. IDing her would prove impossible. She was shot to the back of her head and it destroyed her once beautiful face. Dwayne had given his only daughter a beautiful insignia ring. Dwayne Rich goes down to identify the body without his wife. They don't allow him to see his daughter. They simply show him the ring that was found on her finger and he knew it was Heather. Heather's body would later be confirmed with the identity due to dental records. And Dwayne Rich was tasked with the duty of going back home, walking into his house, and telling his wife. Gail said this about that day. She said, quote, Dwayne walked in the door, and I took one look at him, and I knew she was dead. I said, just tell me. Say it real fast and get it over with. He told me someone had shot her and thrown her into the water and that she was never coming home. I remember screaming and beating on him for an hour saying, no, no, no. The tiny town roared with talk of Heather Rich's murder. And Randy remembers hearing the day they found her body was also the same day as homecoming. Heather was to ride with Josh in the parade, and instead she was laying on a cold medical examiner's table. Randy remembers hearing the news of her body being found as he stood at the water fountain. His world stopped in that moment. Time stopped ticking. The captain of the football team, the town's prized football star, was later crowned homecoming king that very night. And under the bright stadium lights, Randy stood guilt-ridden as his body simply went through the motions. Texas Ranger Lane Akin drove through the back roads of Belknap Creek. The girl floating in the small creek when Akin arrived was close to his own daughter's age. Heather's case would take its toll on those who chased after the three Oklahoma boys who crossed into Texas and committed the worst crime you could. Texas is known for the amount of people who sit on death row. They're also known for having a, quote, express lane to the gurney. The fact that the face of the investigation to the riches was a highly respected Texas Ranger gave them solace in the worst time they could have gone through. Leads came and went, and each day the investigation went on, Atkin drove back to Texas knowing there was something missing. Dwayne and Gail would bury the one and only daughter they had. During the funeral, no one was ever allowed to touch the casket, and it was at her parents' request. They had promised their daughter that those who did this to her would never touch her again. They made good on that promise. As Akin took a closer look at the trailer and what went down that night of October 2nd and into the morning of October 3rd, Randy was staying home. He was away from the two that he felt were responsible for Heather's murder. His drinking had gone from once in a while as he hung out with friends to an, a daily occurrence. He was staying high. He could not relive that night out on that deserted bridge. Akin would see his interview from the Homecoming King article and his response to the question of what words of wisdom do you have for the underclassmen? Randy responded with, quote, cruise the back roads and you can't help but wonder are those parting words of a grieving friend or was randy's guilt coming to the surface one afternoon akin and a da from the montague county's office dropped in on randy after football practice 
One look at him, and they knew that he was involved in Heather's murder. And now they were going to find out how and why. Randy had been questioned before, but his story kept coming across as rehearsed. Had the boys nailed down a story after what happened at the bridge that night? Did they go over something in case they were approached by law enforcement? By the story that Randy kept giving every time he was asked about what happened that night, you can almost say that's exactly what they did. But when Akin and FBI agent Gad got a hold of Curtis Gamble, he provided them with a different story where Randy was coming across and repeating his story over and over and over, and it was almost verbatim, and they definitely knew it was rehearsed, Curtis was not the same. But the next morning, the investigators, they got the break they needed. In the small town of Warica, Oklahoma, there's only one place you could go and buy 12-gauge double-lot buckshot. Four boxes had just recently been purchased and put on the charge account of the Bagwells. The guy behind the counter said he sold those four boxes to Josh and a friend. And when he was shown a photograph lineup of different people, he immediately picked out Curtis Gamble. At this point, Akin goes and he pays a visit to Curtis's grandmother. Um... And prior, when she was asked if he, she thought that her grandson had anything to do with Heather's murder, she said no. But when she learned that that ammunition fit his shotgun, Old Blackie, and she knows he just got rid of it, she knew her grandson was involved. And she even says, I think, at one point that she was concerned just being in the same home. The afternoon that the news broke that Heather's body was found, she couldn't believe it had been found in the same spot she had taken Curtis fishing in when he was a boy. And Curtis was outside on the porch, and she, she says he was messing around, and she told him, you know, hey, they found that girl's body. And Curtis says something to the extent of, I don't care about that stupid girl. And she, even at that point, she kind of watched her grandson to kind of gauge his reaction. But it wasn't until investigators brought back the fact that the ammunition that was purchased and used fit his shotgun that he loved but gave away. Something was fishy here and she knew it. And she didn't have a choice. She had to tell the investigators. So at this point, hearing about Curtis getting rid of his favorite shotgun, they knew not only did they know that that shotgun was the murder weapon, they knew that Curtis Gamble was their trigger man. On October 24th, 1996, Curtis Gamble was brought in for questioning. And at first he was insistent that he and Josh had used the ammunition for hunting and he could even take them to the place where they used it. Now, for any of you who are my gun gurus out there, you'll know that if you're hunting with 12 gauge double lot buckshot, you're going to blow the hole through something. It's used for a bigger game, but most people purchase it for home defense. It's an easy thing to load. It's going to stop whoever you fire it into. Most people don't hunt with it because if you shoot, you know, even a medium sized deer, that's not something you're going to eat because you're going to blow a hole right through everything and just tear the animal apart. It's going to be no good. But Curtis insists that him and Josh had used it hunting. So FBI agent Gad gives in and he's like, okay, we'll take you out to these pastures. You show me. So they get out there and guess what they can't find? The spent shells from the double lot ammunition. And Curtis is still sticking to his story. And as they're heading back, the FBI agent, he has enough, pulls over to the side of the road, and he really starts to press Curtis about what happened that night of October 2nd and how he was involved. Curtis breaks at this point. The difference is, Gamble's story says, Randy Wood is your trigger man. Here's Curtis's story. He said that him and two of his buddies were drinking at Josh's trailer the night of October 2nd. When Heather arrives, she has 
consensual sex with all three of them before she passes out from drinking. Curtis says that they all freaked out, afraid that when Heather woke back up, she would accuse them all of raping her. So the three dress her, load her into the pickup, and take off into the night, driving the back roads in southern Oklahoma. Gamble said that there was nothing they could do at this point because they had already kidnapped her. Out at Belknap Bridge, they got her out, they set her up, then Curtis says Randy grabbed old Blackie, firing one shot into the back of her head, and the other eight shots into her back. Then together, the three teens would throw her body into the water below. When Gail hears this story, she knows that's not right. Don't get it wrong. She knows those three. They kidnapped her daughter. They raped her. They murdered her. But as far as Randy Wood being the trigger man, didn't add up. Curtis's grandmother, Rita, she was able to identify Belknap Bridge as a place that she would take Curtis fishing. And then you add in the fact that it was his shotgun used. Akin knew he just needed the right story. And Curtis Gamble wasn't giving it to him. Curtis would eventually submit to a polygraph test based off of the story that he had told the FBI agent and Texas Ranger Atkin, and surprise, surprise, he failed it. And now it was time for Randy to give up his story of what happened that night. Randy almost gave the exact same story. The difference was Curtis was the trigger man, and as far as consensual sex went, Heather more than likely didn't consent to sex with Curtis. Randy said that when he was in the bedroom with her, she was in and out of consciousness. He admitted to touching her, but he never engaged in sex. But what Randy didn't really realize was that digital penetration was still a form of sex. Randy said that when Heather woke up screaming, Curtis is the one who got freaked out and he hatched the plan to kill her. Once they had loaded her into the back of the truck and took off, there was no real plan of where they were going. And so Randy had hoped they were just going to drive around, sober her up, and talk to her. However, when Curtis had Josh pull over to the side of the road and he got behind the wheel and he headed in the direction of Belknap Creek, Randy knew, Curtis knew where he was going. And at the bridge, Randy and Josh got out and they set Heather up, leaning her up against the guardrail. Randy never really wanted to believe what was going to happen next. He crawled into the truck. He put his hands over his ears. He squeezed his eyes shut and he heard one shot, followed by several more. And then he climbed out of the truck and when he looked up, Curtis was holding the shotgun and Heather was dead. And Randy said, quote, I let it happen. I was scared to death of him. As Randy gave his version of what happened in the early hours of October 3rd, Texas Ranger Atkin was serving a warrant for the arrest of Joshua Bagwell. And the affluent teenager was angry he was being woken up. Randy ended up taking a polygraph test for his story, and he, he passed. Both Randy and Curtis gave statements implicating Josh in the involvement of Heather's murder. However, Josh refused to give a statement. He was refused to answer any questioning, and when they asked him if he would take a polygraph, he refused, because as far as Josh was concerned, they had nothing on him. Montague DA prosecutor Tim Cole was the son of a preacher. He grew up not far from Belknap Bridge in the tiny town of St. Joe. He was known for his intense, steadfast presence in the courtroom, even sending a couple of his classmates to prison. But he knew there was no way he was going to send Josh to prison on a capital murder charge with the evidence alone. He was going to need the testimony of Curtis and Randy. And in order to secure that testimony, he would have to offer up plea deals. But he needed to talk to Dwayne and Gail Rich first. So he went out and he talked to Heather's parents. And he had hoped that even though he knew he could get the death penalty for Curtis, 
he wasn't satisfied of letting Josh get away and putting a needle in Curtis is in Curtis's arm. He wanted to get all three teenagers, and he had hoped that Dwayne and Gail would agree with him, and they would. They agreed for the DA to offer up a plea deal for Curtis, and that plea deal would save him from the needle. Cole ends up offering two different plea deals. He offers one to Curtis, which includes him getting up and testifying against Josh, but he also has to admit that he was the trigger man that night. If he did those things, he would receive an automatic life sentence without the possibility of parole. Now, Randy, he got a better deal. He was offered life in prison with the possibility of parole after 30 years served in exchange for his testimony and guilty plea. Both teens took their plea deals. In February of 1998, Joshua Luke Bagwell stood trial for the charge of capital murder in the death of Heather Rich. He sat behind the defense table clad in a suit and a high-powered team of lawyers thanks to his family. However, the jury, they couldn't see what was underneath that suit. Josh was sporting some new gel house ink, some of which were white power symbols and a swastika. Josh was no model prisoner, and they didn't know that either. They didn't know that he had been in trouble for trying to incite a riot. They didn't know he was a mouthy one telling guards that he would kill them. And Josh was not going to stay behind bars where he would stare at them day in and day out. Eventually, guards noticed that he had been working chipping away at the cinder block in his cell. Every time I hear that, I automatically go back and think of Shawshank Redemption. However, that was early 1900s, and Josh is looking at the late 1900s, where just getting through the wall isn't going to be enough to escape prison. But he didn't care. He wasn't going to stay there. Because in his mind, nobody could tie him to the murder of Heather Rich. And if they could, then his grandparents had enough money to buy his way out of it. Josh's team of lawyers would paint Heather in the worst light that they could. They brought up her drinking. They brought up her drug use. They brought up her promiscuity. And when Heather's mother, Gail, was on the stand, they cross-examined her and said this to her. Quote, she was your perfect child, but she wasn't quite perfect, right? I know that that's their job, but I still have a hard time with defense lawyers attacking the victim. Just not my favorite thing. Curtis would stand up on the, he would stand up in the court and he would testify for the prosecution. He was swore under oath. He sat down. And then it became story hour for Curtis Gamble. He would tell a tall tale where Randy was the trigger man. Curtis had reneged on his plea deal. However, he still implicated himself in the murder of Heather, and therefore he pled guilty to capital murder. So he got his sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole even though he never did say he was the trigger man. D.A. Cole watched as Josh slipped through his fingers. Randy walked into the courtroom next, set to testify for the prosecution. But after Curtis's showmanship, Cole was completely unsure how this was going to go because Randy gave up his plea deal the night before. However, Randy would had other plans. Randy took the stand without the protection of his plea deal and he testified not only to Josh's role in the murder of Heather Rich, but to him being guilty by being up there. Randy was under the impression that since he wasn't standing on the bridge with Curtis and Josh and he didn't see Heather get killed, that he was not really truly guilty of murder. There was one 
little mistake he failed to see. The three boys crossed state lines into the great state of Texas. And here in Texas, we have a special law and it would come into play for this very case. Texas law of parties is as states, a person can be criminally responsible for the actions of another in certain circumstances, including if an attempt to carry out a conspiracy to commit one felony, another felony is committed by one oath, the conspirators, all conspirators are guilty of the felony actually committed, though having no intent to commit it. If the offense was committed in furtherance of an unlawful purpose and was one that should have been anticipated as a result of carrying out the conspiracy, Randy Wood was guilty. Randy Wood committed suicide in the courtroom that day. He incriminated himself in capital murder in the murder of Heather Rich, and he did so without the protection of his plea deal from D.A. Cole. Gail says she watched Randy that day on the stand, and she knew when she looked into his eyes, he was telling the truth. However, had anyone known what would happen when the arrogant Josh Bagwell take the stand in his own defense? then the testimonies of Randy and Curtis would not have been needed because when Josh was asked to tell the court what happened that night on the bridge, he would end up stumbling over his words. He says, while urinating off the side of the bridge, Josh went, ran back to see what had happened. And he said, quote, I see Curtis, or I mean, excuse me, I see Randy lowering the gun. That slip up would sell the jury. Joshua Luke Bagwell was found guilty of capital murder and would be sentenced to 99 years in prison without the possibility of parole. Heather's parents had held up the other part of their promise to their baby girl to make everyone pay who helped take her life. Josh's mother was not a happy camper. She had this to say after his conviction to the press. Quote, my son is no angel, but he damn sure is no murderer. Gail would get to stand up and talk to Josh in the sentencing hearing. And as soon as she got up to speak, his family took it as a cue. She said, quote, by your family exiting, I see why you are the way you are. You haven't you haven't ever had to pay for the mistakes you made, but you're going to now. You took away the most important thing in our life. Josh snarled in disgust as Gail spoke to him. Dwayne and Gail Rich separated after the death of their daughter and went on to marry again, finding love they had lost together. Unfortunately, Dwayne Rich passed away on September 11, 2014. Gail fought brain cancer after losing her second husband and passed away only four months after her first husband, Dwayne, on January 10, 2015. Both of Heather's parents are there with Heather. In the end, we watched the lives of four teenagers end one night on a desolate bridge in the middle of Texas country. None of them knew how their stories would play out. Curtis did not want to go to jail for rape, so he says, Part of me wonders if he was hell-bent on living out his fantasy of kidnapping, raping, and killing a girl, and he used Josh and Randy as a means to do so. Josh led his life thinking he was untouchable and would go to great lengths to make sure of it. What he never accounted on was money cannot bring a person back. Randy tried to change his life, the one filled with drugs and alcohol, but one bad decision provided him with a lifetime of time to relive the early morning hours of October 3rd, 1996. Randy has been in the same unit since 2002 
he is said to be a model inmate having no disciplinary actions against him in nearly 20 years. Curtis and Josh's lives are harder to find out about. Neither one is open to reliving their crimes. In December of 2013, Josh Bagwell was charged with criminal conspiracy and received an additional one year and two months to his sentence. Curtis Gamble has managed to stay out of trouble, not earning any additional outside charges. I don't doubt that he is still being a soldier as he once referred to himself. He has nothing to lose. Neither him or Josh have a chance to see the light of day as a free man. Heather's murder still shakes the small community of Wariga to its core, and some believe that the bridge at Belknap Creek is haunted. It is said that you can go out to the bridge close to midnight and hear Heather Rich's screams echo through the valley of the creek. I want to thank you all for joining me tonight as we tackle a case not known to many, but more brutal than even those who shine in the light of infamy. Don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an upload and drop that five star review. And as always, I will leave you with one last line. In the end, we only regret the chances we didn't take. Much love, the true crime librarian.